Good morning. I'm Bill Roberts. I'm a family physician and professor at the University of Minnesota and an ACSM past president from 2004-2005. Among my special interests is illness and injury in, in distance runners. And it's with great pride that I introduce today's featured showcase speakers. In recent years, no athlete has carried the torch for American distance running like Mev Kalevsky. And my apologies for the pronunciation. I'm from Minnesota, so that's the best I can do. Uh, innate talent, along with innovative and evolving training methods, uh, have allowed Meb to deliver remarkable running performances that seem to defy his age. Meb is a three-time USA cross-country champion, the silver medalist in the 2004 Athens Olympic Men's Marathon, the winner of the 2009 New York City Marathon, and now following his second place finish in the Men's Marathon Qualifier in February in LA, he'll represent the US in Rio as America's oldest ever distance Olympian. And in the years, ACS, this year's ACSM host city of Boston, really hard to overlook his performance here in 2014. We have a quick video for you. Meb, again and again, you've pushed the setting sun back up into the sky. You are like, every time people go, ah, Meb, he's getting old, it's boom, Meb comes back. You know, you have to do the small things that make the big difference. I still do the same thing that I used to do, and, and I have that passion for running, and I want to give it back as much as I can. City Marathon win. Well, you know, it's this is all going to be interesting. This sets it up to be dramatic. Ben Kofleski just slightly pulling away from Joseph Atboy. And it looks as though he's trying to make a move here. This is amazing. I'm just amazed what Meb is doing. Meanwhile, Meb Kofleski looks just as solid and spry as he did in the beginning. Meb Kofleski to become the first American Boston champion since 1983. This is it now. Boylston Street is all mess. An American will win the Boston Marathon. Yes, he will. And his name is Mel Kofleski. This is beyond running, it's just for Boston, for the United States, and for the world. I'm gonna go to the finish line as strong as I can. If somebody beat me, I'm gonna inspire others to do it. We're also privileged to, to welcome Dr. Stephen Van Camp to today's session. Steve is a retired cardiologist from San Diego with 25 years in private practice, was a clinical professor of medicine at the University of California, Irvine, and a past president of ACSM in 1995-96. Among his specialty areas was marathon medicine. Unique to today's topics on Meb's history and his training methods, Steve brings a personal and family relationship with Meb stretching back some 25 years ago. I can clearly remember Stephen that was in the mid-90s when he was in his president years and I was coming up through the, the, the administrative ranks and he's, he's going, you've got to see this guy run, you've got to see this guy run. 
And he's at this meeting with us in the state championships in California this weekend, and so he's always missing it. And, and he, he was just so excited. And he said, this guy's gonna be great. And uh, he told me, just remember the name, Meb. So I think you'll enjoy what you'll see today, and they have a very special connection that, that uh, you will come through to you. So with special thanks to Elliptigo for making today's session possible, please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Van Camp and Olympic and New York Boston Marathon legend, Mev Kevlowski. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is a special time for me to be here uh, with Meb and to talk about him and have him talk about himself and his approach. Uh, I don't know if Bill mentioned it, but uh, how, how, uh, how old do you all think uh, Meb is? 30. 30. <laughs> He's 41. He won Boston uh, two weeks before he was uh, 39. His, his birthday is 5575. So you can file that away and, and watch his progress. But he's been really remarkable in being able to be at a high level since uh, my wife, uh, Gail, and I first saw him as a ninth grader at San Diego High School. Uh, that year, he finished 25th in the cross country, large school cross country in California as a ninth grader, which is no small uh, deal. And he's maintained uh, a high level uh, ever since that. And this year he will be his fourth Olympic Games in Rio. He, one of the reasons he told me he wanted to keep running was so his uh, youngest daughter could see what, what he was doing because she was. She's four now? She's six now. She's six now, so she didn't quite understand the Olympics uh, in, in London. Uh, but uh, one of the things we're gonna talk about today is how he's maintained his uh, fitness and ability to compete at a high level um, uh, to, to this age and to, to thrive and we'll get him to talk about some of the changes he's made and uh, what he considers uh, appropriate cross-training approaches. And uh, there's a lot for all of us to learn. We always say a healthy MEB is hard to beat, and, uh, but how do you stay healthy? Those of you who run know that's no small deal. Um, doesn't that, didn't that video just choke you up? Uh, it chokes me up every time I, I, I see it. What, how do you feel when you watch that? I also get choked up because it just brings emotion. Uh, you know, you have a dream and dream and reality meet and that's when it happened and, and sometimes you just can have the visualization to make things happen and when it happens it's like you have sometimes have to pinch yourself, is it real? And every time I see that I get motivated and it was just an epic moment for me and Boston and for the whole world. And as many of you know, that was the year after the terrible bombings at the finish line. And uh, Meb's goal, and he talked to Ryan Hall about this, is uh, we, we want an American to win for this, to reestablish some, some healing. And I think you were like the 19th fastest runner there, but you showed up healthy. And uh, he doesn't make too many predictions to me because he's probably afraid I'll get carried away with excitement. But he did tell my wife, he says, I, he, you either told her you want to win it or you're, you think you could win it? What did you, do you remember what you told her or how you felt before the run? Well, you know, thanks everybody for coming. It's a great honor to be here. But uh, Gail Van Camp, if you could still please stand up. And Dr. Steve Van Camp were my, almost like my parents, just because the history behind 1990 when they met me, they just welcomed me to their house and the run to win philosophy started at their house and uh, giving the best that you can. So. When it came to 2014 Boston Marathon, I just says, I'm going to run to win. I'm going to inspire people. You know, you can't play defense or time out and running, but you're going to give it the best that you can. And the slogan was Boston Strong Year. After the bombing, I'm going to give a map strong. Whatever happens with the results, I'll, I'll be happy to live with it. But uh, so I just gave all that I had. I probably sent a text to Gail saying, 
I'm going to run the win. I'm going to give it all that I have, and the rest will take care of itself. And uh, as Dr. Van Kem alluded to, I sent a text to Ryan Hall right after the 2013 Boston Marathon. I was there for four and a half hours watching the race, and then said, you know what, we can get this one, and we can, we can do this. And he flew that day and sent me a text, so we'll get after it. And, uh, and then 2014, it all came together for me. Just, uh, it was my dream to win the Boston Marathon, but I was 39. Almost two weeks after my 39th birthday, the 19th fastest guy going in, the most loaded field assembled ever at the Boston Marathon, and most experts had less than 1% chance for me to win it, but <laughs> that's... Uh, so much for experts. Nobody, nobody can test the work that you do every day in, day out when the camera's not watching, and you just got to go out there and have fun and work hard, and you, get, you set goals, and you go execute it, and that's what I did on that day, and I uh, feel blessed to be the first American to win in, you know, in uh, 31 years, and uh, it just... It was an epic moment, and I, I wrote, I don't know if you saw the picture, but I wrote the victim's names on my bed to get draw inspiration and go out there and try to use the crowd, try to use the spirit of the victims and go execute a good plan. The plan was to kind of like um, my mentor, Bob Larson, I said, don't worry about it. I'm not going to be in the lead until the last 5K, but you have to be flexible. <laughs> You have to change your strategy, tactics, and uh, five miles to go into the five miles into the race. They basically said uh, the Ethiopian tried to be tactical, tried to slow it down. I said, you know what? I'm going to give it all that I have, and no matter this what. This is five miles into the race. Five miles into the race, the Ethiopian is trying to slow it down, and bear in mind, uh, I'll tell you later. But my first marathon was a miserable experience, and this was my 19th marathon, so I used a little wisdom and experience in it. So I took off, and I'm like seven, eight miles into it, I was like. What are they doing? They're not, you know, they're making the biggest mistake of their life. You know, I won New York. I was silver medalist, fourth of the, fourth of the Olympic Games. And Joseph R. Boyd, who was right next to me, I just said, you know what? Let's just keep pushing. And you, you probably hear sometimes the athlete been in the athlete zone. And going to the halfway point, I don't remember. You know, I did not remember going to the halfway point. I see 13 on my watch, 13.79. And I see 107 something. And I'm like, what was my halfway split trying to do in my head? I'm like, don't worry about it. <laughs> Boston is all about the title and uh, just, just be, be in the moment. And then about 14 and a half, 15 miles, just for a boy kind of bump into me and I tell mental note, he's getting fatigued. So just, you know, I'd done the Boston Marathon two other times. I knew the, the hills, heartbreak hills and uh, challenging course to Newton. I just said basically, don't, you know, don't push it. But at the same time, you want to be by yourself. You don't want somebody to get you out of your comfort zone. And, uh, Kept pushing and pushing about 18 and a half, 19 miles. I was hurting pretty bad, but the crowd was amazing. They were chasing USA, USA, and I couldn't help it. I started joining them, USA. <laughs> and, uh, and then basically I just said, you know what? You need to concentrate. You got to run the race. You can do that afterward. And uh, <laughs> after the Newton Hills, the Heartbreak Hills, it was uh, 21 miles. Uh, it was, the hard part was over, but at 22 miles, I get cramped on my left side. Uh, 23 miles, something told me, look to your right, I see an orange jersey. So in my visualization in training, I try to see what is happening in the race and just, you know, assess. And so I came down to Boylston. and that was my visualization. Now three things came to mind. Slow down, save your energy for Boylston Street, or try to maintain the gap, or try to extend the gap. And uh, at 24 miles, uh, bad things happen to your body when you start pushing the pace. And... I almost throwing up, but you can't go to the side and throw up. Just got to hold your head up and keep moving forward. Uh, 25 miles, basically, I just said, you know, this is for Boston. Use the spirit of victims. Use the crowd. And now, Meb, did you know that somebody was gaining on you? Well, so let me ask. Let me stop here. Has there anybody ran that race in this crowd who ran that race? Yeah. Did, did you all know that uh, an American was at the lead? Do you, Heartbreak Hill. Oh, after he won. Okay, so, so how, many, how many were in that race? Okay, how many have run any of Meb's races? Has anybody ever beaten him in a race? <laughs> actually, actually uh, people have beaten you, haven't they? And when Meb was first having his success at, uh, after Athens, when he won the silver medal in 2004, 
I said to myself, you know, a lot of guys have beaten Meb over the years, and I'll bet that is going to give them inspiration. I mean, this guy, he, you know, you think he's Superman, but he's, he's had some Clark Kent days, too. And he's had some good days when other people have had Superman days. So, uh, but I think if some people thought, gee, I beat him once. Maybe if I just stick with it and we need inspiration from, uh, from people. And rather than being intimidated, now, nowadays we want people to be intimidated by you, right? <laughs> but um, it'll get settled in the streets, as we say, right? So, so uh, I think that helped a lot of the runners keep going because uh, he was he was they thought beatable but now he's come into a new a new level okay so you got this guy did you know somebody was gaining on you no I did not as most of you may know that Boston Marathon is point to point so he didn't have turns where you can see who's following you so I had about a minute and 15 lead I got down to five second lead with the one mile to go, and uh, yeah, I remember that. I got a little nervous. Me too. <laughs> I was getting really nervous. Uh, but you have to use his tactics and strategy. You got a lot of thinking. It's not just one foot after another. Sometimes you got to use the nine inch above the shoulder. Some, of course, Joe V Hill said. Um, um, so basically, I just at that point, I just said basically, if that person was feeling good, he should have been with me. But he's not, so he must be hurting as bad as I'm hurting. So I just kept pushing and pushing. And with the Boston Marathon, they had 1K to go. And as Americans like to think in miles, but those uh, uh, Kenyan and South Asian like to think about kilometers. So it takes about three minutes to cover that 1K usually. So I'm like, he's probably thinking, three minutes of pain, three minutes of pain. I'm like, well, that's a three minute pain for you too. Just hold on tight. And <laughs> basically, on Hartford is the only turn in the course. So I said, it's about 100, 150 meters. Sprint as hard as you can. The finish line is not the finish line, but the finish line is this turn where he cannot see me. So I just charged really hard and going to boil sand. I just crossed myself. I said, God, thank you for this moment. It looks like 300 meter, but I know for a fact it's a 600 meter where the people have lost races. So don't, don't trip over yourself. <laughs> Don't celebrate too early and keep going and basically, you know, five seconds, whatever it was, and eventually it was just, I wanted to do something where the bombing happened, but it was too big of a race. I just, I crossed myself there in remembrance of the victims. Get pushing and quit pushing. The race is never over until the tape touches your chest. That was such a big relief, even though I was enthusiastic winning. I wanted to keep going. I'm glad it was over because <laughs> I've been trying to get to that finish line for a long time as the guy was getting closer and closer to me. So it was just uh, an amazing moment for me. My wife, Yordanos, was there. My mentor, Bob Larson, was there. My brother, Howie, was there. So, you know, it was, it was just an uh, emotional day and uh, a blessing day and just... Happy to be able to get to that finish line. And before I started the race, I said, you know, this is where 36,000 deep of runners, we wanted to own Boylston Street to something positive from the catastrophic moment that we had in 2013. And to get there and get it done, I didn't, you know, you can believe in your training, but it has to come all together. And it all came together for me. And uh, it was just uh, an, an opportunity that was there. but. You just got to maximize your potential. And uh, I was healthy. As Steve said, uh, it's hard. A healthy man is hard to beat. And I tried to use that and, uh, and get to that finish line as, as strong as I can. And I celebrated in a, in a big way just because, you know, you have those dreams. And when the dreams and reality meet, it's, it doesn't happen every day, but it does happen once in a while. And I was just happy to be there. Now, uh Tell us about your early uh, life. Uh, you were born in Eritrea, which is in Eastern Africa, Eritrean born, San Diego raised. How did, how did that come, come to pass? So I just get back here, in fact, for not even 24 hours, I just got back from Eritrea where we, the Eritreans celebrate the 25th anniversary of the independence. So yes, I was born in Eritrea in 1975 in the middle of a 30, what happened to be 30 years of war. And it was tough conditions just because when there's war, you don't know what tomorrow holds, you don't know what the future holds, there's not a lot of opportunities. And I remember my 
older brothers who I have two older brothers hiding in the bushes because the this was this was a war between uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea. Correct. There was a war for Ethiopia and Eritrea that the Ethiopian soldiers would come around at night, host, cover the village, and if you are 12 years old or older, they'll pick you and take you and give you a lot of training or just put a gun in your hand and you're ready to go. But so those Futsum and AK of my older brothers have to hide that. And for me, I was fortunately was not old enough, but I saw that. And in fact, I saw a landmine exploding in a kid, you know, that was a year or older than I was. But it was a tough conditions, no opportunities to go to school and tough situations. And uh, so the hardship definitely helped me who I am. Uh, my parents, my dad has to walk 225 miles to Sudan in the wilderness where there's hyenas, lions, scorpions, snakes, and all he had was a stick and a box of match uh, in case the hyenas come at night and just assemble some, some woods so he can light up. And then he would sleep in the trees just because if you sleep on the ground, mm. you become a meal. So you need a little bit of warning. So he would do that and he's leaving behind uh, five kids, a wife, and one on the way, and basically he said, uh, if the name, the, you know, you can't tell the ultrasound with the baby, you didn't know what's it's going to be, a boy or girl, and tell a, he told my mom that if it's a boy, call him Bimnet, and if it's a girl, call Amina, which is, we trust that one day that I, if I make a safe land, I will look after you guys and happen to be a boy, and his name is Bimnet, to be able to just trust, and then he worked two, three different jobs in Sudan, and then he eventually went to Italy, where my half-sister's mom was living there. She helped him get there, and he worked two, three different jobs there as a custodian or landscaper and all those things. And, uh, you know, one day, basically, he saw his boss, Dr. Brindici, asked, uh, was some working hard. He says, well, why are you working so hard? He's like, well, I got to save six kids and a wife. And Dr. Brindici asked him, you know, how much money you need? And he said, 10 million lire. So 1970, in 1985, 86, that was a 6,000 US dollars. And Dr. Brindich asked him if that's to save one person or the whole family. And my dad explained to him that with the mind that he had saved, it would save the whole family, six kids and a wife. And that conversation happened on Friday. And Dr. Brindich asked him to come back on Wednesday, I believe. And he gave him an envelope full of money and uh, basically 10 million liter in cash in Italy. And he says, this is not a loan, it's a gift, and that's how we got saved. And uh, if it wasn't so, for that so opportunity... You, fa how long did you... Uh, so your family was able to come to Italy. How long were you there before you went to San Diego? Um, we were there in Italy for a year and a half. It was tough to be an immigrant because you don't know... You know, you're learning new culture, new food, new language, and I learned fluently six months Italian language, but it was the first time at 10 years old that I ever saw a TV. I didn't know how the people fit in there, so I went behind the screen <laughs> and watched them. And uh, so you get a reality check when you grow up without electricity or running water and all those things. But, you know, with Italians, my teacher uh, pretty, pretty much kind of put me under her arm and took me on the weekends sometimes to her house. But so we lived there for a year and a half. And then we tried to go to Sweden. We tried to go to Canada. Uh, we went to Sweden. We stayed at a refugee camp for a week, and they sent us back to Italy. And... Uh, they were going to try to send us back to Ethiopia, so we have to be a lot of stuff to have to work out. And then we tried to go to Canada, it didn't work. But on October 21st, 1987, we came to the United States, uh, the land of opportunity. And I remember having the conversation with our parents. They said, we did not have this opportunity. See your cousins, your uncles don't have this opportunity. Don't waste it. And my dad woke us up at 4.30 AM before we went to 7.30 class in, in, to learn vocabulary through English and be able to work hard. And, you know, uh, so it was when we came to the United States, my oldest brother was in ninth grade. Imagine that now in a new country where you don't know the language, you put us in ninth grade. My other brother was put in seventh grade. Even though I was at uh, the age of 13, I was supposed to be in seventh grade. They put me in sixth grade so I could use that one year to learn English. And uh, basically, my brother got the most outstanding student of the ninth graders. And he got a plaque. We all dressed up real nicely and went up there and uh, watched him get that uh, trophy. And my parents, to this day, they always put it on the top of the TV before they were flat screen TVs uh, <laughs> as a remembrance of hard work does pay off. And my brother just gave me that trophy as a gift. But that's how 
the hard work came and G G Gail based and I were at that ceremony Ruth. and um, our daughter went to the same junior high and uh, Fitzsum was a year ahead and he kept getting you know this guy with a funny name kept getting all the awards and <laughs> We, so we asked another teacher, who is this? And they said, this is Fitzsum Kofleski, and he's just the hardest worker. And your, but your dad emphasized education. And um, you have how many siblings, 10 siblings? Mm -hmm. And how many of them have graduated from college? Nine. Nine. And, and one is still in? Still working at it. Still working at it. His, his older brother's an electrical engineer. His uh, older brother has an MBA. Uh, his uh, other brother uh, is an a his agent, uh, graduated from UCLA Law School. His uh, sister uh, graduated from UCLA undergraduate and UCLA Medical School. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the hardest working, uh, most outstanding family I've ever seen, and uh, while I'm thinking about it, Meb is the most disciplined person I've ever seen. It's not just uh, the God-given genetic talent, but it's what he's done to develop. Your dad was fine with sports, though, wasn't he? Yeah, my parents always emphasize education, and, but athletic was fine, and you know, I was, you know, Gretchen and Noel, their daughters were common. My dad would come orange juice or apples or fruits with Morley feel where we're the league championship or CIF. So yeah, my dad was all into athletic. In fact, when we first moved to San Diego, there was, you know, Bobo Park, which is not too far away from, half a mile probably from our first apartment. And we used to juggle the soccer ball to the Molly Field. And uh, one Saturday happened to be, you know, people were running and they were not, they didn't have a soccer ball, anything. I don't know, like, <laughs> what they running for? <laughs> And it actually happened to be the Kinney, Kinney, Foot Lock, Kinney Foot Locker now championships. That was 1987. We came in October. I'm pretty sure it was in November or end of November or December. I'm like, what are those people running for? And they're crazy. And I became one of those crazy people that run. So, but yeah, my dad was okay with it. He used to take us to the park and Bobo Park, do the drills, whatever, if it's the pull ups or push ups and whatever those, you know, instruction park information there. We used to go there around him and do those things. So now, my dad wasn't too... Now we have another uh, two hours to talk about his career, right? <laughs> we, we don't, unfortunately. Well, um, Meb has a book called Run to Overcome, which documents his early life and life up till the time he won the New York City Marathon. And it's, it's well worth reading and inspirational and be inspirational for the kids you coach as, as well as you. Uh, you had success at San Diego High School, where we're state champion in cross country, 1,600, 3,200, equivalent to the mile and two mile, was national champion in a mile and two mile. Adam Goucher uh, had a better day than you did in the Foot Locker and was uh, second or first, and you were a strong second. And then he went to UCLA, won four national championships. Uh, and then subsequently uh, got to uh, Athens in 2004. Again, you weren't, uh, well, this was one of the big, this was your international breakthrough, wasn't it? And you were like the 32nd fastest, or well, what are I? 39th. 39th, 30, fastest runner on a warm day, but he had trained very well, Coach Bob Larson had prepared him very well. They knew the course, and he ended up uh, with the silver medal. Did any, has anybody seen that? Did anybody see it live? Were you surprised that uh, he was there? He and Stefano Baldini were, were the last two, and they were, you, were chasing, you were chasing a guy. And, and did you talk to him in Italian? Yes, I did, but I should have made the move right then. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean... My running started in seventh grade P class where I ran. The P teacher said, if you work hard, you're going to get A or B. But if you mess around or give around, you're going to get a DNF. And I want to get that A. I want to get that Roosevelt Mile Club t-shirt that if you run six minutes and 15 seconds, you get that t-shirt like my brothers. And I went really hard. And it wasn't around the track, whether it was baseball field, middle of the campus, and softball field, finished in the middle of the campus. And to my surprise and everybody else's, I ran a 520 mile. 
got me the A, got me the T-shirt, and eventually in, in Athens, obviously, basically, um, yeah, I was, I had, I remember having the conversation with Dr. Van Camp said, because I made the 10K team and made the marathon team, I was American record in the, marath in the 10K and the 39th fastest guy in the marathon, and which, which one should I go? Should I do the 10K, have a two week vacation because it gets done early? <laughs> or you try to do the last event to the closing ceremony and at 6 p.m. at the last day. And uh, I remember we were having a, a house. It's like once the last time that an American has won or been in the front of a contention for a medal. And I remember that conversation just saying, you know, go out there and have fun. And, you know, the U.S. would get energized to just see an American be in contention with six miles to go or 10K. If you win medal, great, but if you don't, at least if you give them hope. And, and that's what we did. And then to be in Athens, where the origin of the, the Olympics, to be from Marathon to Athens, the, 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 you know, how the name got Marathon, and uh, hot and hilly and tough conditions. I think Paul Turgot was, uh, was uh, at the time the world record holder, 204.55. My best time was 210.03. I was hoping to give me a mile to spare head start, but I couldn't convince them. <laughs> and basically, you know, the race just started. Started really how do you know the US USOC did a great job on illustrating how to run in the heat. We were in extra layers, closing training. I was sitting in the sauna before in, in preparation and start slow and finish strong. And basically, uh, the, sun, the the Lima from Brazil was in the lead. And Stefano Boldin and I, you got, you got down to five people and you try to get down to four people. And now you're can just going to be happy to be one person to get a medal. And basically, I told Stefano Boldini, Indiamo uno a due, which means let's go get one and two in Italian. But I made a mistake. I should have moved right then because he has no idea. What is this guy, an African American, speaking Italian right away? I should have made that move. But I didn't. I look back and that that was my fourth marathon ever. So my first marathon was a disaster, which I said I will never do another marathon again. And uh, does that so, sound familiar to anybody? <laughs> so in the back of my head, I was thinking, you know, to the marathon you go through good and bad phases. And uh, I said that 204 guy can turn it on. He's going through a bad phase, and so protect the medal. Basically, I was happy to, you know, I think I could get the silver. But then a mile ago, I threw my hat and I tried to go for Stefano Boldini. I was running like. 433, and I think, and he was running just ha like one of those days. He was having an incredible, incredible day. He made the move. He was, I think that was his 16th or 18th marathon. So he used a great experience with 5K to go and made a move, and he came home with the with the gold. But I was so delighted to be a silver medalist and happy to. My goal in 2000, before I left the stadium, the Sydney Stadium, was to bring a medal for our country. And at that time, I thought it was going to be in the 10K, but it was in the marathon and you know, for, became the first American in 28 years to win a medal for our country. The, uh, <laughs> that, was, that was an epic day. We, uh, I watched the replay with uh, your high school coach, Ed, Ed Ramos, uh, and um, it, it, was, it was wonderful. Uh, you didn't run high mileage when you were in high school, and Coach Larson brought you along, but then you're now running higher mileage, but that probably got you into some trouble uh, in 2008. You got hurt um, and, and had some real low times, and 2008, he was born in 75, run those numbers, okay, so now he's 33. But he came back to win New York City in 2009, and that was, uh, that was a great accomplishment. But uh, let's talk about uh, uh, what you've done now is you don't, quite, you don't run the 130 miles. You don't need to check that box on your training log. And how have you supplemented your training with cross training. Now, in your book, he's got another book, uh, Meb for Mortals. In the, pre, in the <laughs> preface, he says, I've accomplished all my goals, so now I'm willing to share some of my secrets <laughs> with you. But he makes the point that cross country, he doesn't, uh, cross training applies to cardiovascular aerobic activity. You, you don't include stretching and core conditioning in what you call cross-training. So that would be aqua running, 
uh, and you've tried different things, but what, what have you tried over the years and what do you do now and how has it helped you? Well, since education came first in priority in our family, it's hard to put running in priority. So for me, you know, yes, I run 100 to 130 miles a week, but it all started with 25 in high school to 35 to 45 and eventually, I think it was 98 when I was a senior at UCLA when I broke 100 miles a week hmm. and I had Achilles tendonitis, knee tendonitis, and all those things. So when I was at UCLA, I did agua jogging. You know, you know, I'm not a very good swimmer, but I could run in the water. As long as, you know, just move those arms as fast as you can, you can stay afloat. And eventually, as I did in Athens, as my fourth marathon, I really wanted to, to win my next marathon. 70 days later, I finished second in New York and people thought Athens was a fluke. So he tried to prove people wrong. And now I really tried one to win to Beijing and make, maybe get another Olympics, uh, another medal. But you know, you push, you push, you push, you're gonna get injured. And now what I have done is with the elliptical, I use that a lot just because I don't do the evening runs. So often people they ask me, do you run every day? I'm like, I just tell them I run 12 times a week. That means twice a day. And to get 100, 110 miles. But now, instead of going for the, my second run, I go on my lip to go and go for like an hour and 45 to two hours. Um, no pounding, no impact on the body, and even if you're gonna run hard the next day, it doesn't take a lot out of you. Um, so the whole point is to stay healthy and consistent, and elliptical has allowed me to do that. And obviously, I also have modified my training. Instead of seven day cycle, I did that to nine day cycle, so it's like, E hard, easy, easy, hard, easy, easy, hard, and instead of whereas in the past it was like Tuesday was every day, was, every Tuesday was intervals, every Friday was a tempo run, every Sunday was a long run. Now I just feel how my body feels and adapt to it and make changes. I say I felt strong on my endurance, I need to emphasize on my tempos or intervals. And so having those self assessment kind of helps a lot because, you know, I've been running for 26 years. I have run over 100,000 miles. That's three, four times around the world. I'm on my fifth lap. <laughs> um, so those mileage, you just gotta, you know, you gotta help, keep it healthy. And what does, how do you, in the past, it's been like agua jogging, but now I use my lip to go to be able to just um, keep, uh, keep healthy and get that extra cardiovascular because, you know, climbing a hill or just going for a 20 mile bike ride, you know, Otherwise, I would just do three to four miles or maybe five at the maximum on my evening runs. This has allowed me to go for an hour and 45. So do you want to do 30 minute exercise or do you want to go two hour exercise? That's a big difference. And then also nutritionally, I have adapted to change because I was so poor in the air chair that I even ate dirt to survive. When I went to UCLA, I just said, well, eat all you can because you gotta make up for the time lost. <laughs> So I gained quite a bit of pounds, and an exercise physiologist did a study, and he says, write down everything that you eat, and all the walks and exercise that you do, and I was consuming about 6,000 6, calories. For my side, that's a lot. Um, he says, you're lucky you run, you're lucky you have good genetics, otherwise you'll be obese. So that was 1997, because I would go in the dorms, have like pancake, French toast, cereal, Bagel. I mean, you got to make up for the time loss, right? Did, did, you, did you eat with Jonathan Ogden then? He was one of your teammates, wasn't he? Uh, Jonathan Ogden and John Gardina. So, I, in fact, I got a text from Jonathan Gardina yesterday, and, uh, you know, I guess we were, I haven't been on, I've been in Eritrea, so I have not been online, but it was a century to pack 12 or something. He says, congratulations on that kind of achievement. But, uh, yeah, so I used to have a contest more so with John Gardina than Jonathan Ogden, but, you know, those are... Shot put, throw, shot put throwers <laughs> and football players. So, and the shot putters, shot putters, for whatever reason, they always hang down with the distance runners. So, <laughs> uh, if you can eat that, I can out eat you, you know, and have all those contests. And uh, basically, so I just, I would go, I used to go, when I had a, a break, I would come from campus, come to UCLA to the dorms. You know, I lived but, in the dorms for four you, years. You, you weighed about 10 more pounds than you do weigh now, don't you? Yeah, I mean, I was in high school, I was 130, and college, I'm pretty sure I was 135 or 136. And uh, um, my recent weight, I realized, is 125 or under. So I was in 1997, I did all those 
you know, modification because uh, instead of having coming back from campus to try to eat, I would just do a turkey sandwich and a banana instead of coming, coming from campus, eat lasagna or pizza and whatever else that goes with it. So that kind of helped me a lot to, you know, assess. And then that's when I had the big breakthrough was winning the NCAA titles after m making those modifications. Now, uh, how is an, have you read, uh, have you done an elliptical trainer? Hmm? How is, uh, how is, a, why, why is a elliptigo your favorite now? Elliptico or is it your favorite? It is my favorite because I done elliptical in the gym in Mammoth Lakes when I had a piriformis or knee or whatever and I hated it because you're there for, you know, you think you're there for two, three hours, you look at your watch, you've been there for like 15 minutes. <laughs> Whereas this, you know, you take it out, especially living in San Diego, I just take it out for two hours and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go that hill, or I'm gonna go this, I'm gonna go do that, and you're not even looking at your watch. And so that's the difference, you know, be able to be indoors and, you know, you, watch, you can watch the screen, but I mean, how many times can you watch the screen? I would like to be interactive, so, and obviously the gate and uh, mechanics are is similar to here where it versus the elliptical just trying to slide, where this one is kind of helps you do almost a, replicate the running motion. Have, have, you, uh, have you told the, uh, the manufacturers any modifications you would like to see, or are you cool with the way it works now? Uh, I'm really good with this one, the elliptical. They have the arc now, which is, you know, because people ask me when I'm writing it, how much does that thing cost? And I tell them, you know, 2,500 or 2,800. They're like, hmm. But now the manufacturer, which, which is based in Solana Beach, have the, you know, they replicate the same one. It's called the elliptical, uh, elliptical arc, which is smaller and a little bit of a modification, but also reasonable price. Because when you, you invest in your body, whether it's therapy, cross training, or massages, for me, I invest so much in those things. And this is one of the toy, one of those things that the elliptical you have to invest. It's like a gym membership, but for overall. And they have a stationary, if you live in the snow or so, you can have the same thing, just put a stand. It, it can stand, it has a stand. So the, you can put this on a, a mount. Yeah. So, the, you know, I grew up in Ohio, so I would, uh, you know, I know that would be useful on a lot of days there. Uh, in his book, uh, Meb for Mortals, he's got five do's and five don'ts on cross cr training. And I think they, um, they really uh, conceptualize a lot of Im important things. And um, I'll tell you my favorite here is, uh, is a don't. Don't buy an expensive piece of exercise equipment unless you've been on it enough to know you're gonna use it regularly. We've all bought things or d done things. So you wanna try these things, or if you have a friend who has one, or you, or you get your friend to buy one, then, <laughs> Uh, then, um, or maybe buy, get one for the team, get the coach to buy, uh, buy one. Um, some, uh, some of these others are, um, consider it part of your uh, training to supplement. Again, it's for the cardiovascular, but it, there's, there's no uh, wear and tear, or you know, here we'll talk about there's uh, no rhabdomyolysis from the eccentric downhill uh, pounding. If you're gonna run uphills, you gotta run down and that's, that probably beats the legs up more than anything. So this doesn't do this. Um, are there any of these that you especially enjoy um, talking about? I mean, we all love, I personally like to exercise and you can't just run a marathon or you've been injured. You need a bridge to get slowly into your form and you don't wanna make a drastic change by saying, okay, I'm gonna go run six miles on your first day or four miles on your first day, but you can use the elliptical to be able to make that transition to just say, you know what, let me just do a week of muscle movement because you've been injured for a month or two months or years. So you wanna make that transition and those transition needs to be very gradual. You'd rather be like one week late or gaining momentum versus the setback because I'm not a happy person when I'm injured. I don't think many people are not because it just, it just gets in your head and it defeats you, so you want to be able to make that, you know, gap of bridge and say, you know what, I'm gaining, whether it's elliptical riding, and then you'll be able to walk, and then you'll be able to run a mile or two, so you use that transition, because I remember when I was at UCLA, after I had an Achilles, I'm like, they said, go run half mile on the track, I'm like, what is half mile going to do for me, <laughs> you know, but it's just that transition that you have to make, or when I had my rupture quad, start walking on the treadmill just because it have to be level versus going up and down. So it might be the small, 
Part of the reason I've been so successful over the years is doing the small things, pay attention to detail, that make a big difference down the road. You know, you might say half mile or walk, but it just does something to your head to be able to say, you know what, I'm gaining, I'm gaining the, I'm going to the right direction versus, oh, what have I done? You know, you don't want to get setbacks and then setbacks and setbacks after you've been injured. So I think the elliptical can come in handy that way. Now, we're, we're here at the scientific session, so, so somebody out there's got to be saying, show me the data. We've got uh, personal testimony, and it seems to be uh, reasonable, and the biomechanics seem to add up. But uh, I'm going to have Ian uh, Klein from Ohio University come up and talk uh, briefly. He has a uh, study he's going to tell us about. It's uh, presented in abstract form, and it's been, it was published in a peer-reviewed uh, journal. And uh, the issue, come on up here, Ian. This, the, he d doesn't deal with the safety of it. Any therapy, you want to deal with the safety and the efficacy. Is it safe? And is it efficacious? Does it work? So that's what your study dealt with in uh, college runners? Yes, uh, experienced runners. So at Ohio University, we uh, compared four weeks of matched elliptico only training versus run only training, like I said, in experienced runners, and measure things like VO2 max, ventilatory threshold, 5,000 meter time trial uh, times, as well as level of enjoyment, uh, effort, and soreness. And we found that the elliptigo was an effective tool in maintaining those variables over that four week period. We saw a maintenance or an improvement in those physiological uh, variables. The one difference we did find was the elliptigo had less lower body soreness than running. Uh, but the effort was the same, the uh, enjoyment was the same, and compared to running, it is an effective tool. Now, so I stand corrected. You did deal with an element of safety, and, and nobody fell off and broke their collarbone. And, nobody fell and off. So you would, have, you would have told us that. Everybody was safe. But, but in terms safe. of soreness and ability to keep running, um, that there was uh, some establishment or verification of safety in that relation. When they trained, so you compared four weeks of elliptigo training and four weeks of running, and th they were already fit when they started? They were, yes, they were deemed uh, experienced and fit uh, based on a VO2 max test, and both training periods were matched for training volume, training intensity, duration, so they were doing. Were, were, were the time spent uh, different? No. So if it was like running 50 minutes versus elliptigo 50 minutes. Yep, it was a one-to-one -one ratio. Because because you you if instead of going for a 30-minute run, may, might go for a 90-minute ride. So you wonder why maybe you're getting more, and what kind of heart rates do you usually get when you're what what do you, what is your training heart rate? <laughs> My training heart rate is anywhere from one probably 125 to 135, 140 on my easy recovery runs. And what about um, w when you're doing elliptigo training? That's about the same. So that would speak for uh, so you I'm maybe doing... getting more cardiovascular. Now, of course, when running, uh, competitive running, if you're gonna cross train, you want something, because of the specificity of training for muscles, you want something that is comparable. So uh, this establishes that there there's, appears to be comparability. There's another study at this meeting that oh, you'll hear about. Uh, you can go or you can uh, talk to the people in the uh, exhibit hall ab about this. But uh, it, this your study supports the efficacy of elliptigo training. That's correct. Yep. All right. Good job. Thank you. Now. Um, Do we have time for uh, the, a video? You know, edge is just a number. I mean, if not, uh, I feel like uh, a lot of energy. I just have to modify my training. And uh, in fact, elliptical has been a big asset to me. I'm glad it came before I retired because I've been doing a lot of people say, have you been lifting weights? But it's not that. It's the definition from the elliptical that I've been climbing in Mission Hills and taking it for two to three hours spin. So edge. Isn't just a number, but at the same time, by doing supplemental or extra 
for and my love to go, I think has helped me to prevail today. So uh, Meb uh, personifies the dedicated athlete who, and uh, don't you love going to cross country uh, races when you see all these different t-shirts that people wear? I remember we saw one at Ventura once that says that the will to win is nothing without the will to prepare and the will to train. And how, do we have any uh, cross country coaches here? Do we, do we have any uh, the people who are sort of the go-to person in their running group as, as the one who's got, got the smarts? Any, anybody have kids running? That's fun, isn't it? And, uh, and when you, you, who know, that's, how, that's how Gail and I first met Meb. I was the guy in the white uh, shirt and tie who took an afternoon off from running to watch his daughter run cross country. You know, it would be better if we didn't show up for their sake, but, but you know, we want to go see him run. And then you end up seeing Meb and his two brothers uh, and we ended up with the state. We won the, we won, cross, I love cross country. We won, uh, you won the league with uh, three Kofleskis, his two older brothers, and, but uh, Coach Ramos has also uh, won the league with uh, just five kids from the gym class. <laughs> but one year we had Meb and Jose Melgar who were first and third in the sectional and we didn't even win league, right? So what does that tell you? You got to have you got to have five to seven people, and those other people really, r really mean a lot. Um, how are we doing for time? What what time is it? Uh, I think we're 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 close to the end. Is there one question that you get asked more than any other qu question, or amongst the most either uh, about anything? What do you think that these people are really, you know, if I could ask him one question, what would it be? Um, I think probably what is the secret of longevity? Because I'm 41 years old, I'm going to the Olympics, and that's not, never happened again in the U.S. You know, one of the reasons is the discipline, the commitment, and the perseverance, because for me, in 2008, most people, I'm going to the fourth Olympic team, but it was 2000, 2004, no 2008, 2012, and 2016. And never give up on the dream, because if you believe in what you're doing is right, and you keep doing it consistently over and over, you will achieve your dreams. And for me, it's been challenging, but overcoming obstacles has been my childhood, and also injuries and consistency is one of the if I have to pass on is just consistency. I'm pretty sure you guys you got the degrees you got because of being consistent. It just didn't happen over time. You know, you have to be able to persevere and overcome challenges and adversity. And sometimes you win a medal or you get your diploma and you said, oh but there have been other times where you felt like, you know what, that was nice, but I have to overcome this situation to make it happen. And most people think probably two thousand four two thousand twelve fourth place at the London Olympic Games might be my most outstanding race ever. But I didn't win a medal. You know, it's not measured by medal or by that diploma, but at the same time, how do you overcome that situation? If it wasn't for that fourth place finish, which some of you might know, but I was 21st place with halfway to go, and I was thinking of dropping out. People often ask me, do you enjoy, do you enjoy the scenery with the cities you run? I'm like, no. <laughs> I'm thinking about my competitors and how much, see how much spitting they're doing or their game mechanics and all those things. But that day, I'm like, I think this would be a nice cathedral to stop. <laughs> <laughs> but then you come to realize, why are you running? Are you running, you know, I already had signed up for New York. I was getting injured, not injured, but wounded on my bottom of my foot. And I just said, you know what? I, I don't want to do more damage to my career or to my leg, and you want to think past that for New York, but then I'm like, I'm wearing that USA jersey. USA jersey is an honor to represent our country. You know, want to be able, you want to get to that finish line no matter what. And then also my daughters were there, 49 family and friends were watching me. I'm like, you know what, I just got to get that finish line. And I wasn't even thinking oh, how many people I'm going to pass. Instead, I was just getting to that finish line no matter what. And 
to surprise yourself sometimes. You just keep doing and chugging along and one mile after a mile and you move from 21st to 18 to 15 to 12 and you get hope. And then my mentor Bob Larson at that point with 5K to go, it goes like this. I was right next to the Japanese and he goes, sixth place. I'm like, am I in sixth place or the Japanese is in sixth place? <laughs> he didn't clarify. And I'm like, well, if he's in sixth place or I'm, I'm in fifth or sixth, if something or whatever happens, unfortunately, sometimes you hear about the drug allegation that is going on. If those three guys, which I can't see, finish one, two, three, and, this, uh, and I'm, in, I'm in fifth place, I guess I'm a fourth place guy, I got to be able to catch him. And so I was way fading away, but then I see a green jersey. You know, sometimes you learn from your mistakes where you went out too hard and you come back. When you come back, you come back really fast. And I saw a green jersey with uh, two miles to go, and I'm like, I got to get that guy just in case. <laughs> in case something happens to those guys, I want to be able to be the fourth place guy. And if somebody gets caught, I get to move up. And that's what I did. I passed them. The, the Santos from Brazil, I passed them with 500 meters to go. And at that point, I was just challenging myself. And I'm like, I see the flag, the United States flag. I'm like, should I grab it? Should I not? Should I grab it? Should I not? I'm like, just grab it. And then I wanted to run with both hands like this. But then I'm, you need your hand to move really fast. So, and he's trying to protect that fourth place. And I, it's, it's not like the Boston or the New York City Marathon. The finish line was just one dotted line. It wasn't like big finish line. So I'm like, where's the finish line? Where's the finish line? And I see one line and then I'm like, you know, I hold the flag, finish up. And sometimes you have to be able to overcome adversity. And that gave this, me- Have you seen this picture? Yep, that's it. That's the one. And uh, You look you know, pretty happy there. I was happy with fourth place. If it wasn't for that fourth place, I wouldn't be invited to the Boston Marathon. If I wasn't invited to the Boston Marathon, I wouldn't have won the Boston Marathon. So you might see, some people might say, oh, I finished fourth, but it kind of helped. It kind of helps that I was a silver medalist passing in the past. So I know the feeling of that. But fourth place, sometimes you gotta be happy. You're the f best fourth place in the world. I mean, that's that's amazing, you know. So you have to be happy. I always say, run the wind doesn't always mean getting first place, but getting the best out of yourself each time. And that fourth place was pretty pretty magical moment for me as well. R run to win has been one of your models. That it involves getting the best out of yourself and being happy with getting the best out of yourself. Absolutely, I mean, run to win, which we kind of started at your house, uh, it's getting the, the best out of yourself. So if you run a personal best and you finish fifth, you just ran your best time ever. Why do you have room to complain, you know? And if you finish top four and, and three other guys beat you that day, you know, you, ha you gotta be happy with that. And you know, what, that gives you hope. I say, if I could do this and that, the next time around, maybe I will finish second, maybe I'll finish first eventually and you know that's why I, when I ran the, the won the Boston Marathon that gave me confidence that I still got it because going to the London Marathon it was not the perfect training but I maximized that potential for that day and ended up getting fourth place so I'm like it was technically supposed to be my last marathon because <laughs> I think that was it you know but I left one person chance just in case and by finishing fourth you get this new hope said maybe I finished fourth at the Olympic game. Next time I want to make the Olympic team. Might have to win the trials, but I make the four, another Olympic team. And so winning the Boston or winning going to Rio, that race kind of helped me establish uh, my self-esteem. I, I have two quick questions, and then we want Paul uh, Brants of uh, uh, Branks from ACSM to, to finish up our session. If Paul will make his way up here, the um, uh, what day is the Rio Marathon? Rio Marathon is the last day again. I always say uh, the marathon is a disadvantage to the last day, but it's August 21st uh, in Rio. Is that a Sunday? I believe I it's a Sunday. So. Okay. Is that a and and how's, how's your conditioning and are you healthy? Two-part question. <laughs> I am healthy. Uh, my condition is pretty good. I'm definitely not ready to race next week or the first next month, but I think I'll be ready to go on August 21st. But you got about 80 days? Yeah, about you know, 80 days, I believe. Uh, Conditioning is important, but at the same time, you just, you don't want to be ready in end of June or mid of July. I want to be able to be ready on peak yeah. form on August 21st. And Stay healthy. I know you'll represent the U.S. very well. Thanks very much, Meb. We'd like to point out another cross-training study being presented at this week's meeting. Please look for the poster presentation called Impact of Different Cross-Training Modes, 
by Max Paquette of the University of Memphis tomorrow morning. And finally, we'd like to express our thanks once again to Elliptico for bringing Meb and Steve together today and for their support of the ACSM annual meeting. Thanks once again, everyone, and have a great afternoon.